Hello, my name is Ran, and this is the Flow Artist Podcast. Every episode, we interview inspiring movers, thinkers, and teachers about how they find their flow and much, much more. If you love yoga, meditation, or movement, this is the podcast for you. We talk to amazing teachers from Australia and all over the world and try to discover just what it is that makes them do what they do so very well. So just a studio update, we are very close to launching. I'll talk about that in a little bit, but just letting you know, we had this great day of taking photos and just introducing people to the new space. We had a few friends in and it is a beautiful space. We are so very happy to be able to share it with people. We took some people through some anti-gravity yoga. We did some gentle flowing yoga and some meditation and it was a great day. We had snacks, we had food, we had tea and just got to sit down and chat with people. We're going to open the space up on July 28th, which is a Saturday. We're planning to have a week of free classes, so we'd love to meet you. Definitely come on down if you live in the Melbourne area. We're just in the suburb of Northcote, just on the fringes of the city. So please come in and say hi. And as I've said before, we really want this to be an inclusive, friendly and welcoming space for people in any type of body and a big influence on us in that regard is our guest of this episode. Today's episode is a recorded conversation between myself, co-host Joe Stewart and Sarah Harry. Sarah Harry is a psychotherapist, yoga teacher, researcher and university lecturer. Sarah Harry is one of Australia's leading specialists in body image and disordered eating. She appears regularly in the news on TV and in print and is both an expert and a fat yogi. She is also the author of the amazing book Fat Yoga and teaches workshops on the subject of accessible yoga, teaching yoga to people in larger bodies. She is also the proud ambassador for This Girl Can, a campaign for Vic Public Health. Now in this episode... We learn about how Sarah moved from the world of high fashion to becoming one of Australia's leading experts in eating disorders and body image. We learn about the challenges Sarah faced while training to become a yoga teacher. And we also learn about how, as teachers, we can make yoga classes a more welcoming space for people in larger bodies. There is so much good stuff in this episode, but before we get into it, we have a signed copy of Fat Yoga by Sarah Harry to give away. Now just go to podcast.flowartist.com slash fat yoga competition. I'll leave a link in the show notes again and answer the simple question, what is your favorite adaptation to make a yoga pose or physical movement more accessible to people in larger bodies and why? I'm really looking forward to hearing your answer answers so again i have talked more than enough let's get on to the conversation with sarah harry thanks so much for meeting with us today we really appreciate you taking the time to come and speak with us so perhaps we could start by you just giving us a little bit of background and telling us about where you grew up oh wow <laughs> thank you for having me for a start oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, i actually grew up in melbourne but i spent a lot of my childhood traveling so I lived all over the world, was a bit of an expat child, um, and then settled back in Melbourne when I was about 13 and went to school here. And um, I had a totally different career than what I did now. I went to university and, and was a fashion maven. <laughs> uh, I worked for some amazing Italian labels, Giorgio Armani and um, Max Mara and different things when I was young, which was a pathway into what I do now, I guess. It, it seems a world away and I I spent a lot of time having the job that every girl would dream of, but it was very difficult and I was very unwell. I had an eating disorder at the time, so, you know, that fashion environment didn't help me. So, you know, I'm kind of a Melbourne girl. I love I love it here and I've come and go in my early life and, and then when I worked in fashion, I lived in London and spent a lot of time living for periods in, in New York and um, busy spending lots of time in Milan, but... Yeah, I just love Melbourne. Oh, I'm so happy to have you back. I speak on behalf of all of Melbourne. 
And I was really wondering about your transition from fashion into being like a leading expert on eating disorders and body image because the fashion industry is so notorious for placing aesthetics above health and well-being. Did seeing that around you and feeling it within you just yeah. spark something within you to make you want to change? Well, I mean, from when I was very, very young, I wanted to be smaller. Like I felt like in my family there's a strong emphasis on small is better, small is more valuable, it's more beautiful, it's more desirable and so you know I, I was on a million <laughs> diets to be small on my whole I probably started dieting when I was eight or ten and a lot of that was very early damage really in terms of my body image in terms of the eating disorder and the eating disorder was largely secret I didn't tell anyone about it my sister did kind of find out tell my parents and there was a note kind of slipped under my door oh wow a bit oh, no. <laughs> well they were trying they were doing what they could with what they had and they'd made an appointment for me to go and see a specialist but I went once and then I told them I was recovered and they just you know they just bought that, that. Yeah, yeah yeah of wow. course I was not so my transition was that you know after I don't know six or eight years of working in fashion and seeing the cycle of disordered eating, body image, and just constant. I mean, when you work for someone like Harmony, like having your eyebrows waxed is because it's considered a work appointment. You know, we had to it's look just all on about the, game the whole time. Yeah. And so, I mean, I've still kept some of that to some degree. I your love... eyebrows are still a <laughs> <laughs> And I do love fashion and I do love fabric. I collect fabric in my house. I have like some beautiful canthers from India and some amazing fabrics. And But I don't love, I mean, my idea of hell would be to go to Chadston because, uh, you know, when you work as a fashion buyer, you just never want to see another shop again after a while. And I, when I turned 28, I somehow came across a photograph of myself at about eight or 10 when I started had started dieting and I just this was one of those moments I was completely struck because I looked at this girl or this child and I thought that's that's kind of not a fat person, child and like yeah, seeing the photo compared yeah, to your memory of yourself from that how time. I felt yeah. and then you know I I just it just rocked it really kind of rocked me to my core I, I don't know why maybe I was the right it was the right time for recovery in podcaster you quote Keanu Reeves I there was one that was like I was sick and tired of being sick and tired and I remember reading that him saying that and that's what it was for me I was so tired and I was so sick and I was so malnourished even though I didn't look any of those things because people expect eating disorders to look a certain way and of course I wasn't underweight and so nobody was really concerned about me and if I lost weight people would compliment me and they would just keep me drive you know drive on the eating disorder so it's important to understand you know and this is my work now too you can never tell how healthy someone is just by looking at them so I took a day off work actually I rang the eating disorders foundation which I want they're wonderful people now, this will really date me because they posted out to me a list of, <laughs> <laughs> a list of support. I still didn't feel like, like I deserved help. At that time, I was, you know, there's no, there was no connection. There was no internet. There was no blogs. There was no groups. There was no podcasts. I couldn't, I didn't know that people in, could have an eating disorder in a bigger body. And I didn't think I deserved help or treatment. So I still didn't want anyone to know. They pay fashionistas very little. So I enrolled in a trial program at Melbourne Uni and just hit the jackpot. Got probably one of Melbourne's best specialists who remains a dear friend today, um, Dr. Rick Corsman. And he wrote he wrote a book called If Not Dieting Then What. I just really hit the, you know. Like you just landed in exactly the uh, right Yeah, because program it, was a, for you. it was a random, it, there was lots of people you could end up with, and I just randomly ended up with firstly one of the best, and secondly, someone that had written a book about exactly what I needed to hear. I mean, I, recovery was obviously tough, but I. Yeah, that at that point, um, I really clearly remember saying to Rick, if I recover, can I help other people? And if so, what degree should I do? And he was like, I don't, I don't know what degree you should do, but yes, you can. 
And he said to me, just get the highest qualification you had. I already had an arts degree, so I, I thought I could very easily transition into being a psychologist, which did not turn out to be the case. It was much harder. So I, I sold my house. I moved back with my parents. I fully recovered, and I went back to university. Wow, you really changed your life. Totally, completely. And I went to a volunteer for the Eating Disorders Foundation, and from there it was always one thing after another. So I became, you know, once I started working for EDV, I've always been an activist. So that was that was more than 20 years ago. I know somewhere there exists a, a, a DVD of me talking about recovery, where I look probably extremely my young <laughs> so I've always spoke about my story and never after you know after I covered I was always wanting to help people with like my story and then of course now I'm a, a yoga activist and a, and, a, and a size activist and an accessible accessible yoga activist and all these things but I've never been someone that struggled to I always wanted to to help other help others with my voice. Because it was so secret for you for so long, you just yeah, don't want anyone like, else to feel no like shame. that. I didn't want anyone. Uh, there was so much shame for me that I felt like if I talk up, maybe you can dissolve shame. And of course, now with the beautiful Brene Brown, I don't know if you know. Oh, her absolutely. Work. Yeah, yeah, like you know, and she has this beautiful saying: shame is dissolved by empathy. And um, so someone saying me too makes a massive difference. And I mean, I've loved, I love her work. I love everything that she stands for because, you know, she says we're all worthy of love and belonging. And that is absolutely things that I live by. <laughs> In my rooms, you can't see them. It says we can do hard things. And also courage, dear Courage, heart. dear heart. So my patients, because if you can't see us, but we're sitting in my clinical practice rooms and I have these little messages and there's another one over there that says, I am enough. You know, and these are the things that I want all my patients and clients to understand because I'm a psychotherapist as well as a yoga teacher. You know, the yoga teacher I kind of stumbled and fell into. I'd love to know that story. Where did you discover yoga? How did that happen? So I've had a 20 year plus practice of yoga. Before it was in, before there even existed, well, gosh, really, there were no curvy yogis. There were no really very, there were no glamorous studios. I did it in this daggy gym on a Saturday morning. There was a, a, a genuine yogi teaching school. She really, really hated the gym for a start. I knew she did. She jealous every week. <laughs> 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 There's a clue. Yeah, yeah well, yeah, no, because she would say they won't let me run it for an hour and a half. They yeah. only let me run this class for an hour, and you know she complained about that. But she also affirmed, and in some ways, this is not something that I advocate now. But she affirmed to me that she kind of said, "You're great at yoga," and and in my whole life, no one had ever said I was great at sport. Like I was always a kid down the back walking when they did the cross country. I mean, I hated that stuff. I had never felt at home in, in a sporty environment, but I could do yoga. I felt comfortable with yoga. Turns out I'm hypermobile, so of course I can do yoga, which has ended up, you know, in all sorts of fun. <laughs> but, you know, at the time, having someone say, you're really, really great at this, you should do more of it, you know, just as a practice. Mm. I never once in my wildest dreams in my 20s thought I'd be a teacher. And at that time when there was a lot of kind of body image stuff going on and disordered eating going on, how did you feel in your yoga practice? Like, did you feel comfortable in your body then? Was that kind of a glimpse of that? or? Well, what yoga was at that time, because it coincided with me being, you know, on my recovery journey. So it just it's just pure luck, really. It was just another facet yeah, of your recovery. Yeah, it was like, it was part of my recovery, but I didn't plan it as part of my recovery. Whereas now with my patients or clients, I... I try and plan it for them. I'm like, I, you know, I think this person is a good yoga teacher, a good fit for you. I think you should do this. I really think you should meditate. I mean, meditation was considered like something hippies did, and that's. Oh, <laughs> 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 I mean, a funny story is I just my mum's seventy one, and this week finally she was very anxious and I couldn't be there and I said go to my website at the bottom of the page it's good for everyone listening to I guess the bottom of the page is a whole lot of symbols Facebook Instagram there's a little cloud sound cloud all free meditations from me plug them in lie down listen to me help you relax because I couldn't be there to help her anxiety and she rang me a couple of hours later she goes Oh my god, that that stuff actually works. <laughs> I was like, yeah, mum. Yeah, I've been doing it for twenty years, mum. Like, I mean, seriously, she's like, no, 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 no Sarah, it really does work. <laughs> So this is so funny, this 70-year-old woman watching this 
and just I just could, and she did three of them in a row. It was hilarious. Oh, she was like, did. yeah, yeah. So I flipped her right in. She's like, and then when she's having an operation, she was like, I'm gonna listen to that meditation thing. Like that was really amazing. So I've converted one seven year old. Now I need to convert the rest of them. Oh, she'll tell her friends. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. I mean, it's so funny. So it really strengthened my relationship with my body, and I think I didn't have the words for it, but what it did was. It gave me confidence to move. Like, I didn't have a lot of confidence to move. It gave me interoception, which is a word from neuroscience, which means the ability to feel into my body in a positive way. Mm. I mean, we all have interoception all day. You know, when we're hungry, we can feel. But a lot of my clients, so who struggle with the body, struggle with food and eating, don't have interoception. So a lot of people with Like they've shut that message down. They don't feel. You know, they're not fit, they're not tapping in because there's either shame or there's there's something there's something else blocking that. So the group work I do, the individual work that I do, the yoga work that I do, all involves a degree of interoception. And I'm not alone in that work. Bo Forbes in America also does it. Janet Lowndes here in Melbourne. There's very few people that work who are psychotherapists or psychologists and yoga teachers. At the last count was like there were so many of us, but we try to integrate, truly integrate yoga and psychology. And you can see the space. I don't have a large space here, so it is hard. My dream space exists somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, <laughs> where I have imagination is where it starts. Bit of yeah. Well, you know, like I'm still waiting for somebody to say, "Wow, that's an amazing idea. Let's give her all the money." I have to say that every time I'm interviewed, just in case there's someone yeah. listening with oh, all the yeah. money. Like, <laughs> really, I'm like, yeah. I'd like to put that message yeah. out there. Imagine, imagine, it would be so gorgeous. I mean, they've offered me a studio here in my rooms in Hawthorne, but I guess what I'm working towards is offering more accessible yoga. So things like yoga for eating disorders, yoga for mental health, yoga for anxiety, all, all those things. And yoga for people that, what I find is I get a lot of phone calls saying, because I own and run a company called Fat Yoga, which has a divisive name. But people ring me, the first thing they say is, I'm not fat, but. <laughs> <laughs> but I really want to come to your class because it seems like it would be like not one of those fan, you know, like it seems like it would be really welcoming and low pressure and you seem really lovely and whatever. And unfortunately, my answer is, there are lots of spaces for people in smaller bodies to practice yoga. I know I direct them to wonderful people, you know, who do offer, you know, like Anahata at the convent and Recarvest and, you know, all these beautiful Gina McCauley who's in Bread to Go. And there are lots and and Sally, Saraswati and Glenn Waverley, just to, just to give people an idea of there are wonderful teachers out there, but there are also, you know, teachers that don't help and that, to answer your question in the longest possible way. How I fell into yoga teaching was because it had been such an important part of my recovery. I continued to practice. I had many bad, poor learning experiences along the way when I practiced with people. I never practiced at home. I never developed a home practice really until I became a teacher. And so I became a teacher, first of all, thinking, I wasn't going to be accepted, genuinely at 40, because I'm old now, nearly 46. Um, (laughs) I genuinely thought that people were going to say, you can't do this training. Because you've had experiences of walking into yoga classes, right, where you've just been hit by negativity. Oh, absolutely, yeah. In every possible sense. As a teacher, I was told where to pick up the towels. I was like, no, (laughs) I'm the teacher. (laughs) <laughs> um, which is my it's my personal favourite I love that story the dirty towels are over there I'm like um, what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm here to teach yoga uh, class I mean, they were obviously <laughs> expecting the towel lady so I obviously looked like the towel lady <laughs> And I was often mistaken for uh, a beginner, which doesn't bother me, except I wasn't a beginner. So people would pull, teachers would pull me to one side and say, oh, you know, this is kind of the advanced class, maybe come back on Wednesday. And then, of course, my ego would kick in because I hadn't, you know, I hadn't been, I was trained as a teacher and I would take my mat to the front of the class and do everybody advanced asana they could throw at me. And I don't practice like that anymore. 
first of all, I can't because I have a broken knee. Um, but um, my practice has changed. And that's the thing. Like you practice one way in your 20s and another in your 30s and 40s and 70s. Do you know, like we, we our practice evolves into something different. But I have a deep and abiding love for restorative yoga and yin yoga and and also kind of rehabilitative yoga. Times where I've been in hospital and where I've either been injured or struggling, I had postnatal depression. And when I had postnatal depression, I took my mat with me. And the nursing staff were just thrilled. Do you know, like there was no resistance. And they even made spaces for me to practice, you know. So I think there is now an understanding. Well, I mean, that was quite, that was 10 years ago. <laughs> but like the, there, is, there is an understanding that it's a helpful and healing practice. And I decided to become a teacher to help my patients. And I never expected to help anyone else with it. Like I never expected to launch a business or... Go write a book. To, or write a book or go on TV or, you know, tell Larry Ember, teach Larry Ember how to do a downward facing dog. <laughs> Actually, I did that twice with different celebrity presenters, totally driven by them. They're like, um, I did Chrissy Swan's radio show. She does it with, I think, Sam Brown, who's a football player. I'll forgive me if I'm, I'm wrong because... Brownie. I do not know my football yeah, players. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Chris is a beautiful woman. And Brownie, I think, is a football player. And without even – I didn't say one single thing. He's doing his – he's showing me his downward facing dog. <laughs> and Nabi, you know, mom's like, it's lovely. Yeah, like, what, 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 what am I going to say? Like, great downward facing dog. But he was telling me that now yoga is part of uh, elite football. So, you know, it's, it's incredible how much it's spread. And I just wanted to – use it to help people feel better about their bodies and now I guess my journey changed and diverted and became different. Do you want to take us through like all the facets of what you do because you have Pat Yoga which is your book and that's one (laughs) website and then you have Body Positive Australia and you also have Body Peace and they all seem like facets of the same. They are all the same beautiful thing. So for 13 or 14 years I think we've been running Body Positive Australia. So we run groups for people with binge eating and disorder and bulimia, group therapy. We run that continuously. I I think we spent a year (laughs) in the beginning putting it together over our kitchen tables with significant amounts of gin and tonic. And then we didn't know, like I think there were five people in our first group, but we just didn't know... We had this, we had this, um, it's from Field of Dreams, but we, we did have this motto, we'll build it and they will come. Like, we just didn't know. And, and actually, we spent no money, so I don't know why we were so worried, but we, we really wanted to And a lot of time work. and a lot of love just, and a lot of energy. Oh my God, it was just a heart project. Like, just, and this was 15 years ago, when there was no resources for people with binge eating disorder. And it's a little known disorder, but it's actually the most people suffer from it in Australia. So 50% of people that struggle with binge eating disorder are actually men, it's equal to women. Whereas in all the other disorders, it's like 1%, you know, 10% men and 90% women. So a lot of men struggle and they don't come forward. And it's, it's, a, it's a high prevalence disorder, which means there's, a, there's like a lot of people struggling with it. Whereas anorexia is like 1%, you see. So like that's a low prevalence disorder, but you hear a lot about it. And I guess like anorexic people probably end up in hospital because it's a very visible disorder. But It's visible, eating... but binge eating disorder has got caught up in the obesity and I don't like that word and I really dislike it epidemic panic because sometimes and this is not all the time sometimes people with binge eating disorder also are in bigger bodies but it's not always the case there's a big misunderstanding there are a lot of people struggling with binge eating disorder so of the people who are struggling with weight about 30 percent of those will be struggling with binge eating disorder and they are not often don't know they have an eating disorder and their GP or their health provider are continually referring them to diet programs instead of taking a simple medical or psychiatric, asking us a couple of simple psychiatric questions that would tell them that this person has a psychiatric illness and needs to be treated as such. So it's in what we call the DSM, which is the book of all the psychiatric illnesses. So it's a recognised psychiatric disorder with limited treatment options still 15 years later. So we're still really passionate about that. I mean, that has evolved and evolved and evolved as we have learnt and sought more training. And now it has a somatic component, 
which is small because we're talking group therapy, but at the beginning of every group we work on one pranayama, but we don't say it's called that um, <laughs> because we people tend to run away. Um, uh, and then we work on one movement to feel into your body. So 14 times they feel into their bodies in, in a five minutes, simple somatic or yoga, like seated yoga practice. You know, maybe it's a seated twist or a seated forward bend or something. But we are inviting them and a big, big phrase that I use very often is to come home to their bodies, to settle into their bodies and to create peace with their bodies, which that's how body peace came because once people had finished, the eating disorder was kind of doing well, but the body image was hanging around. So body image tends to be something, in my experience, that can be harder to move through because in our society, it is a very, very small-bodied focused society and you're highly, the smaller your body, the more you're regarded. Do you know, like the, the, the higher That's the That's what the media tells us. All yeah. the time, like, you know, thinner is better, thinner is better. And so that's hard if you have body image issues to deal with and I'm a realist so I talk to my patients about like okay well I live in the world too you know I live here with all of the socio-cultural pressure to have you know this kind of body is desirable and attractive and so body peace became my online program which was my first online program which is hugely successful because it's the first time that anybody had ever put yoga and body image psychology together which is actually kind of mind blowing. Yeah, I so know. So much about yoga is about coming home to yourself and making peace with who you are, and yeah. Well, so that I mean, that has yoga classes in it. It has. I was all professionally shot. I just decided I wanted to do it properly. So professionally shot, and <laughs> the really the funny story about that: the sound engineer on one of the eight sessions the sound dropped out and they couldn't fix it to be high enough quality to for what I wanted but in the week between me <laughs> filming this, these videos which was extraordinarily hard work and them realizing I'd gone and cut my long brown hair into a blonde bob <laughs> so we thought he said, it's fine, we'll just redo that, you know, 15-minute segment. I'm like, oh, I've got bad news I look completely you. different. <laughs> so I'm a different person now. We actually have to reshoot the entire thing oh. with, the long, with, the short brown, with the short blonde hair. Because I have this weird hair thing. It's like my special power. It grows like crazy. And so we had to re I had to shoot the damn thing twice. So Body Peace exists online um, and it exists as a Melbourne program as well. And I run that a couple of times a year, Yoga Plus Body. So that's something I do on my own. And I started Body Positive Australia with Fiona Sutherland, who's an amazing dietitian. And she and I also have separate projects. So my project is Body Peace and Fat Yoga. And she, the most amazing thing is that since I became a yoga teacher, she actually sent me, and, and she in no way needed to, but she sent me this wonderful message one day saying, I just wondered if you thought it would be okay if I became a yoga teacher too. <laughs> Do and I think step on your toes? I've inspired another, another dietitian to become a yoga teacher too, and I'm like, oh, yes, this, it's fabulous. We want, like... Like, this, this is my mission. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, spread the word, baby. And all the teachers that teach for me at Fat Yoga, we have about six classes a week, I guess. They're all, they all do different things. So Fiona teaches for me. She's a dietitian and a yoga teacher, and I have a published a editor and a yoga teacher, and I have a bio scientist so, so like an, an anatomist and a yoga teacher she's amazing Susie she's got a workshop coming up and who else do I have just incredible people Kate's a social worker at, oh I think we've got two social workers actually and a yoga teacher so they're all people that I have chosen my people really carefully and who I used to working with people who are, are struggling in some way and to have an understanding of I guess part of partly psychology of yoga and stuff so I wanted them to be special people who understood accessibility and understood they're not all in big bodies and that was the challenge that was always going to be the challenge there isn't that many people around well actually when I go to Yoga Australia things I think there are people around they just they don't either want to work with me or they have their own thing and they don't need to because I see diversity in that in Yoga Australia, but not very good luck recruiting 
people of bigger bodies. So if anyone's out there in a bigger body that's a yoga teacher in Melbourne, please make yourself known to me. I'd love to help and, you know, I'd love to, you know, have people that are in bigger bodies because if you're just a, just a gigging yoga teacher, I know that one person I worked with, she just, you know, no one would hire her. So that was really tough. <laughs> I was the only so person that would hire her. So, yeah, it, it is hard. So... It exploded without me anticipating that it, it would, and um, it afforded me a huge amount of reach. Which you obviously just tapped into a need. Yeah, and also offended a lot of people. Didn't like the way that I used the word fat, so it got a lot of attention. So you know, I went on the project, and they did a great job of the segment. They came and they filmed a class, and they talked to me. And hilariously, I left my. Um, <laughs> I left my outfits. I hung them, washed them, cleaned them, dried them, and ironed them, and hung them in the back. See, the back of the door. Of the, so as I was leaving, I would pick them up. Oh, yeah. And I got to the car park to let the film crew in. And I had Hannah, one of my teachers, with me. I think I was wearing a sleeveless kind of t-shirt and a Just pair super of casual. Target trackies. Because I was going to get dressed, but I had done my face. Yeah. I, done my face. I had two outfits, one for teaching yoga and one for, you know, the interview. I was all, I was so ready. Mm-hmm. The and fashion we, background. Yeah, yeah. and we in. got there and poor Hannah, I don't know if she's ever recovered from this. I didn't even, I'm a, trust me, I'm a nicer person than this usually. We got there, we realised I had left my clothes and here I am in the car park wearing like basically like my pajamas. pajamas. <laughs> And I said to Hannah, take off your clothes. <laughs> and then, so she had this absolute, she had this kind of gorgeous, but didn't really for me, but, but um, you close know, enough. <laughs> close enough cardigan. And that's what I did. And, the, and this film crew were hilarious. They're like, oh, it's fine. It's gorgeous. Don't worry about it. And when you see the thing, you don't really even, I mean, but it was so funny. She just didn't even get a choice. I'm just taking it off. Just, just take it off right now. <laughs> and, and it just was not really my personality, but thank God it fit me. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Because it was that stretchy fabric. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, there was a lot of media interest. I got a lot of, you know, that's where I got the comment back from people, from somebody that really did hear me saying, you know, you have no right to be a yoga teacher. You, know, you are not a yoga teacher. And that nobody who is in that body can be oh all themselves gosh. a, a so yoga teacher. So did that teacher. come from a yoga teacher? Yeah, yeah. Wow. And I think that really hurt me. And, look, I try and let things, for the most part, I hold a lot of stuff with self-compassion. But... That was like, you know, a really big misunderstanding of the fact that there is diversity in the world, there's diversity in the yoga world, as there is in the normal world. And I guess she had some ideas, some ideas that I'd had myself. Like, I mean, I remember the first two teacher training places I approached made me cry because one of them told me I couldn't keep up and the other one told me they wouldn't offer me some flexibility around Saturday where I, as a group therapist, I've worked every Saturday for the last 20 years and they could have because they had an online, uh, so they had a distance education module which they could have let me do but they just, in the end, just gave me such a hard time that I pulled out and then I finally called IYTA which is International Yoga Teachers Australia and they're based in Sydney I think they now only do like an 800 hour (laughs) teaching but at the time was a little bit shorter and so I did it by distance and by in person and they were just super welcoming and amazing and I think the not-for-profit part of their business was really showed. Um, <laughs> and they, I never felt anything other than, than welcome. But mainly I worked at it by myself, you know, because I did it. I'm a single parent. I, um, I, I work a lot and I did it. I was on my own. So when I finished, I really have a Melbourne community of yoga teachers that I knew. And I've slowly chipped away and found some people, some, some people that are really supportive of me and my work and they're wonderful yoga teachers but when I finished I was like I have no yoga friends <laughs> whereas most people when they finish yeah, their teacher training they're like, like they have their yoga friends training, you know yeah. like I was like I have no yoga friends <laughs> and what do I do how do I make yoga friends <laughs> sounds like you've really done well at generating <laughs> <friends of community, laughs> <though. laughs> well I have a community of students I have an amazing community of students so we have a private group you know where there's 1300 of us fat yoga 
people <laughs> where we love it's a lovely supportive community you know people often talk about how hard it is to maintain some of these private groups and moderation and stuff but I don't have that problem because we are just it is just a lovely group of supportive men and women who have been excluded from yoga and have just found a home with fat yoga and you know and from fat yoga from the classes came I, I, you know and people think it was all kind of it'd be handed to me on a plate but I pitched very hard for that book deal it sounds like you <laughs> made your own plate like you've created I did, this I from did. your own I lived experience saw, I saw it at the same time I was uh, an ambassador for the same year that I launched Fat Yoga. I was an ambassador for Kellogg's, a body positive ambassador. And their whole thing was we, we want women to feel good about themselves. We don't want to focus on food. We want to focus on... So Fiona and I were both ambassadors. And we did wonderful workshops. We actually did a lot of work behind the scenes. We crunched a lot of numbers for them and analysed their research and did some of my more academic work. And then we did some wonderful events and I did a lot of speaking, you know, for them. I've loved the ambassadorship work. So I'm also, this year, I'm an ambassador for Vic Health, which... I think is incredible. We'll put a link to that video because that's a really yes. beautiful video. Yes, oh my god, that video, video! I love that video. I just, I, you know, so you do this stuff. I actually did that with a broken knee over and over again, doing that handstand like that, and um, over and over again. I mean, I've really recovered really, really well. Um, and I was told I'd never practice yoga again. I think probably maybe the last time I saw you, I was I would never practice yoga again. And I, I have, I have rehabbed and pain managed through the brain and through meditation and through you know pain starts in the brain there's a lot of very complex stuff around that that I won't go into but my knee is is got a crack in it and it's also completely bone on bone so it needs I need a new knee and I'm not going to get one because I have done the work the rehab to allow myself to be relatively pain free through lots and lots and lots and lots of different strategies <laughs> and also you know I spent a lot of time in hospital this year so it's been a tough year my back then went and I couldn't walk so they wheeled me into rehab and I walked out I had to learn to walk again and now this week my um, my second last week of outpatient rehab I mean I've been doing rehab for six months I think maybe and before that a year of trying to avoid surgery I couldn't avoid the surgery so they've done what they can without taking my knee out and that will hopefully hold me forever. That's my dream, um, that I will never have to have that knee taken out. And I now now I am working on just walking without a limp. Do you know, like, it's so I'm like, whoa. I mean, because there were days where I cried. You know, I had my, you know, they have those rails in rehab and you see, sometimes see people learning how to walk and my, you know, my hip went and my knee went and then my back went and I'm like hanging onto these things just crying, being wheeled back to my room. But it really has been a journey mm. this year teaching myself and that that journey brought me to Accessible Yoga and to Juvena who, who is the founder of Accessible Yoga in the US and so I'm also an Accessible Yoga ambassador as well. I love being a Vic Health ambassador though because Vic Health has traditionally only, you know, had small bodied athletes and consistently every time they put something up with me in it it gets a really warm good response and I'm just so so happy with being involved in mainstream health promotion because I think people need to see that fitness and health and and you don't owe that to anybody nobody owes fitness or health to anybody you know like you can do whatever you want with your body I believe in body autonomy but I love to be I love to be a disruptor and I love that you know both Kellogg's the company that also doesn't use large body people very often and Vic Health have chosen me to be an, an ambassador for them because that that's meaningful to me it means that it's not meaningful because I feel a sense of pride in my work it's meaningful because it, it gets the message to the people I want to hear the message do you know, like Absolutely. I want people to see that video, not because I think I look fabulous in it, it's quite hilarious, and I've got Harry High pants in it, definitely, but, um, <laughs> but, um, but I want people to see that they can do it too, and I'm 46, I'm not young, I'm injured as, and you can do it. 
Well, one thing that really struck me in the training that we did with you yeah. was the statistic that 60% of people are in what's considered a larger body. And you asked how many people see that represented in the yoga classes that they teach. Yeah. And nobody did. Nobody did. So do you think part of that is just like a lack of representation and maybe a couple of experiences like you had walking into a yoga class yeah. and feeling yeah. unwelcome? Yeah, it's those people that phone me up and say, can I come to your class? I think what happens is people come to the class and they never come back. Because they see only small body, you know, fancy pants, literally. I mean, I love myself some fancy pants, <laughs> some yoga pants. But they see that and they don't find they're either ignored. And, not, and it's not because the teachers aren't great people. They are good people. They just aren't really well taught how to double level teach, which is what I teach, double or triple level teaching. And I'm a big fan of not having the peak pose. You've got to get to the headstand or you've got to get to the, that's the pinnacle of yoga. That's the destination. Yeah, yeah. Like you're in the yoga if you can stand on your head. Well, I actually, you know, um, will reference a New York Times article which says you should never do that because there is a percentage chance you'll crack your neck and be paralyzed forever. So if you tell me that I am never going to teach a headstand in my class, you will never get a headstand in my class because the percentage chance that one person could hurt themselves is too large for me. This is a safe space. I run safe spaces. I facilitate safe spaces. There's no diet talk. There's no fat talk. There's no numbers talk. There's no, not that there's much time to talk. We're yogaing, but the thing, Sometimes those messages really sneak in though. They're like, just a little, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With things like challenges, you know, studio challenges and teachers giving advice around food and eating or detoxing or even things like like, you know, detox your leaf up, detox your body by twisting. You know, that's actually anatomically impossible. You're giving your, you're giving your liver a beautiful, fresh supply of blood. There's a lot of benefit to it. But your liver and kidneys detox your body, as does your skin. There is no other way to detox your body. So if you want to, you can drink all the tea, fat, body. They, they send me things all the time. They've offered me huge amounts of money to say they, I drink Like, have they not skinny. read any of your other messaging? <laughs> I know. Skinny me tea, I think it is. Oh God, I think I just promoted them. Oh, Inadvertently, no. <laughs> it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. And but they keep persisting in sending me things to think I might. You know, it sounds like lots of people want to give me money. This is desperately untrue. But you know, that is the sort of thing that I really don't believe in. I mean, I really don't believe in that stuff. And and it's a diet free zone. It's a um, and very much based in ethics and scope of practice which a lot of people don't even know what that is. You know, it means what you are and aren't allowed to do as a yoga teacher. Mm. Guess what? You're not allowed to give nutritional advice. And actually, I am in the middle of trying to work out what the Australian law is, but I have just found out what the American law is. In the American law, you're actually not allowed to touch someone at all. It's illegal as a yoga teacher to touch a body. You have to have a special license to be a toucher of bodies, which is like a masseuse or a chiropractor or, you know, physio. And that's very clearly outlined in the law, although a lot of American yogis still do hands-on adjustments. And a lot of teacher trainers still teach you to do that. Yes, that's right. So I'm still trying to organize myself to, and I, I need to involve Yoga Australia probably in that too, to find out what the exact law is in Australia. But it's definitely the US law is you are not by law allowed to touch someone else's body unless you're licensed to. I can give someone psychological advice because I'm licensed to, you know? Like, you're a psychologist. But, but, no, you're a psychotherapist. But I, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Like, why would I? But if someone asked me for a referral, I could do that. If they said, they asked me a question that's within my scope as a, as a yoga teacher and a therapist, I could potentially answer those two questions. Like with Fiona, for example, my teacher who's a dietitian, she could answer a food question. She probably wouldn't because she's teaching a yoga class. So yeah, she'd bit, probably say, okay, come back and see come me. Come and my... see me in my rooms yeah. and that's where I wear that hat. And, you know, it's hard for all of us who wear different hats. I wear a lot of hats. I'm an activist. I'm a therapist, you know, a psychotherapist. I'm a yoga teacher. I love to do training. I'm going to LA to deliver the accessible yoga training and I'm so excited and, and I'm going to do it in Sydney too and I'm so excited about that. Like my mission is to get as many teachers as I can to understand what accessible yoga means and what it would mean for their business as well because I think people are missing out on a lot of 
people. Well, and I know that it's such an adaptable practice. You can like, do it. It's yeah. so open to being tailored for everyone's individual needs. You just need a you just need a little toolkit, do you know? And somebody somebody left from the training that you guys were at, somebody left me the most incredible message about how she'd done two two hundred hours of teacher training and that two or three hours she spent with me was better than the entire 200 hours that she, you know, had done. And I was blown away. I was like, that's amazing because we cover it a lot in a yeah, short period yeah. of time. But it's such simple stuff that can completely transform your class and make it so much more welcoming. And you don't have to do much. You don't have to learn too much. You just have to sort of be open to changing some small things, you know. Um, and that's the same with people that come to my classes. You know, it's very simple. There are some very simple things. I mean, I love chairs. And, and you know, going through my own rehab and learning to walk, kind of walk again meant that I, I understood physio, they're ahead of us, do you know? I have what's called a, you know, a relapse prevention plan. I have contingency plans, so I know what to do. And they are really great because they offer me a program that's in, in bed, lying down, sitting up and standing up. And, it, and I think, like, I think about yoga and I think, you know, we need to be able to offer yoga that's lying in a bed, sitting in a chair and standing in a class. That's kind of like such a simple thing because as we age and as our population ages, I know it sounds funny, but bed yoga, like, you know, like, you know, being able to be in lying down. And of course, I know that there are eight limbs and you can practice all the others, but there are some physical things that I can do all my physical rehab practices, which are also very much like yoga practices in, in a bed if I need to. I think as well, sometimes it's having those building blocks it's kind of in your mind like it opens up other possibilities as well it means that you don't just see a pose as like oh I have to be standing up and putting my arm here and bending my yeah, knee here no. you kind of can look at the body in different dimensions and different angles and think well so say I did need to be lying down how could I still achieve yeah, yeah. what I'm looking for mm. in that pose once you open your eyes, you can actually transform something into something by the wall, something by a chair, something that can be supported. And also, we need to kind of throw out the rule. And I'm not – there are some amazing people doing amazing work in this area. I'm not the first person to say that. But in terms of alignment, do you know, we can't say you need to put this arm here and this if it doesn't – because we know now that every single skeleton in the world – is different. And so even like between the sides of the skeleton, it's yeah, different. Yeah, it's not the same. So so I would say, why don't you try this? Maybe we'll give you an example of, you know, the traditional, when you've got your knee bent in a warrior pose, for example, the knee is over the ankle to keep the knee safe. Well, if that doesn't work for your knee, for whatever reason, maybe it doesn't bend to that angle, maybe it's it hurts. There are some yoga teachers who will still say you should have that or will come around and correct you. Like I've been in, in a warrior pose in the way that I do warrior pose it's best for my pelvis and hips and someone's come and gone, you need to line it up with the inside of you. I'm like, no. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> and then I've explained later, you know, like I'm not rude. And so we need to start throwing out rules and start listening to bodies. Mm. And who made those rules anyway? Like they've been passed down but a lot of them – don't so, seem to have a basis in well, anything in that tradition. Well, small body date year old Indian men. Yeah, boys, yeah. You know, like, and, and that's not suitable for a Western man or woman, and it's particularly not suitable for women's pelvises to keep stability. So, you know. And it seems like just over the thousands of years that yoga has been a practice, like it has always evolved and like it started as a one-on-one -on -one individual practice. Mm. So it's almost like we're actually just getting back to that of it's your practice. and Just listen to your body. Because if I give you, say something to you, then everyone in my class has permission to, I mean, we don't have classes where people are doing whatever the hell they want, whatever the hell they want. But if I'm like, take your arms very slowly above your head, so, you know, not, not jamming your shoulders, then then I'm like, and, and if that doesn't work for you, just bring them down into your heart space. Do you know? Like if you've got a shoulder, it's so simple to cue stuff. 
and that's what I hope to offer. You know, like that's what I hope to offer is is not too wordy, simple and accessible and getting people to start listening to their own interoceptive stuff, which is an 18th century word, ironically, and make it modern so that people can listen to their bodies and let their bodies tell them that hurts. There is no good pain in yoga. There, there's edge, you know, in yin. Mm. You can look at that edge in yin and edge in some yoga postures, but there is no good pain. And that is how people get injured, by not listening to their bodies adequately and having teachers that insist on alignment rules because they were taught that way, which is, which is okay, but there's no flexibility in it for everybody is different. And you think if this is a practice of being present and tuning into what's happening in yes. this present moment and there's a pain message which mm-hmm. your body yeah, is firing yeah, yeah, at yeah, you yeah, yeah. and you're shutting that out, like that's not Well, it's the opposite of interoception and it's the opposite of listening to your body and it's the opposite of honouring your body and honouring your yoga practice. But there are ways in which you can make that more accessible for people simply because they believe you stand at the front of the class and you tell them what to do. One of my favourite classes was when one of my students, she was unwell, but she still wanted to come. And so she rolled out her mat in the back corner and she always brings her own props, so she had her own props and she's a beautiful, beautiful person. And she propped herself up into a restorative pose, what I call the queen's posture. It's, it's in my book if you don't know what it is. Ha <laughs> 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 Available at all good bookstores. And she just took a shavasana for the entire class. She just wanted to be there in the calm space with, you know, I do a meditation. At the end, I do, I do centering, somatic, um, in, interoceptive feeling in the beginning. So, I mean, that, that in itself is, you know, 20 minutes. So she wanted to be there. And for me, the pride of having someone to have the courage to lie down through my entire class, I was like, All right, I'm, this, is, this is winning. Do you know, like, it's just like, Definitely. it's not, it's not the show of person doing the handstand in the front, do you know, that it's kind of distracting to everyone else. It's the person that can honor their body and do and that. And the person who's like in tune with themselves enough yeah. to go, this is what I need in this moment. And it's okay yeah. to do that. Absolutely. Because they're, they're given, they're permissioned. So I'm all about permissioning people. So do it if you, if it feels good, don't do it if it doesn't feel good. And here's another option. So it means I work quite hard and I think quite hard. Luckily in therapy, the patient does more work than me. (laughs) (laughs) So, yes, that's kind of how it works. And I guess as well, once you have a culture in your class of these are multiple options, you don't need to kind of go into the details every week. Like, it's that culture. They know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they do. So they learn and they know and they understand. And and I and then and then I teach I I have to teach new people as they come along, they're allowed to. You're allowed to put the hands down if their arms hurt. Do you know? Like, you're allowed to stop. You're allowed to come out of downward facing dog when you've had enough. It's amazing. Seems so obvious. And yes. I know. <laughs> Revolutionary. <laughs> <laughs> and so, thank you so much for taking the time to speak oh, to us today. Uh, I love to talk yoga. Can you tell? <laughs> <laughs> so do we. It's yeah. what we do. <laughs> Is there like a passing note, like if there was anything that you really wanted people to soak up when they were in your presence or in your practice or reading one of your books, what is the one thing that you'd really like to pass on? Well, I think, I mean, I think for me, the the things that I really love is firstly, the most important thing about you is not what you look like. And secondly, your body is your home, you know, and the idea of really beginning to attune yourself and listen to it and understand what it's saying to you and then honor it you know and find body peace in that way come home like but i think it's both forms or actually both forms and tara brach and you know all these people not not revolutionary concepts but come home to your body or sit down in your body that's what i want people to remember beautiful thank you so much (laughs) thank you for having me oh pleasure so I have these beautiful things called body piece cards that are available on the website and there's 52 of them. So I'm just going to pick out two. How I look is not as important as how I feel. May I appreciate my body just a little more in this moment as it is. That's the beautiful Anna Gas Jelly. Another one from Brene Brown. Vulnerability is the birthplace of innovation, creativity and change. So I have these beautiful cards and I ask people 
you know, put a, pull a few out for your practice, for your intention, or just have them in, in your life, in your, you know, they're beautiful colors. And I do free delivery for $25 in Australia and, and yeah, post them out to you. Yeah, and pick they are really result. beautiful. And I do see a little hint of your creative <laughs> style loving background. Yeah, like yeah my cards are designs good. on the other side. <laughs> and I've got to say, you've done so much stuff. You must have an incredible work ethic. <laughs> I've worked out hard in the last couple of years. I'm trying to have a be a bit more slow now. <laughs> it's time to stress it up. Yeah, yeah, more stress <laughs> Exactly. Thank oh, you. My pick of the week, which is a nature documentary for the second picture <laughs> of the We've been watching Earth 2 and it's so amazing. Like the technology now to be able to see like a little gecko in the desert in the fog getting little water droplets on its skin and then like drinking them off for its oh breakfast. God. It's incredible and it just makes you just even more aware of how precious and amazing our earth is oh, and nice. yeah we've been loving it mm-hmm. and i promise to not have a nature documentary for the <laughs> next <thing. laughs> gorgeous excellent and my pick of the week is a bit of a different one i've just been going to a totally different yoga studio than i normally have been practicing it and i've just found the change quite wonderful just getting different perspectives and finding different things i can actually incorporate into my own yeah, classes and love, things like that so yeah i recommend if, if you're perhaps hitting a, a bit of a bit of a spot of lack of inspiration perhaps just branch um, out branch out i love practice. it i love going to other people's classes mm-hmm. yeah awesome one that's great Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been beautiful. Thank Thank you. you. Another great episode, another great conversation. And as I mentioned at the beginning, Sarah Harry is a real influence on how we want our own studio space to be and also on the type of conversations we want to have on this podcast because we both sincerely believe that yoga, meditation and movement, they're so vital for our physical and our emotional and spiritual well-being that everybody should feel welcome, should feel included and should just be able to join in without fear of judgment. So such a great influence on us and we really look forward to doing more of that in the future. Anyway, Moving on, our next episode is an interview with Shannon Crow, Canadian yoga teacher and host of the Connected Yoga Teacher podcast. The theme of this episode is on community and on building community, and we got so much out of that episode, we found we could just put a lot of advice that she gave into practice straight away. So there's a lot of good stuff there that I feel that anyone listening can put into their own work so really looking forward to putting out this one now if you haven't already please subscribe rate and review on itunes google Podcasts, or wherever you download your podcast from it'll really help us grow the podcast our theme song is baby robots by ghost soul he kindly gave us permission to use his music so go out and buy his stuff buy as much as you can from ghostsoul.bandcamp.com You'll hear from us again in two weeks, but until then, aroha nui, big, big love.